Hello and welcome. This video series is intended to be a practical introduction into MATLAB programming. It's primarily aimed at undergraduate science and engineering students at the junior or senior level. The course will move quickly, but it assumes no prior programming experience. In order to complete the weekly assignments, you'll need access to a full version of MATLAB and Simulink. If you do not have one, you can download a free 30-day trial of the full version from MathWorks.com. MATLAB is a programming platform designed specifically for scientists and engineers. At the heart of MATLAB is the MATLAB language, which is a matrix-based language allowing the most natural expression of computational mathematics. With MATLAB, you can analyze real data, develop complex algorithms, create models, and run simulations. Millions of scientists and engineers in academia and industry use MATLAB worldwide. MATLAB is used in a wide range of applications, including machine learning, signal processing, image processing, control systems, testing and measurement, computational finance, and computational biology, to name a few. To get started, open the MATLAB environment by double-clicking the MATLAB icon. You'll see that the basic MATLAB interface has four primary components. The command window is an area where you can execute single lines of code. This area is very much like the screen on your calculator. You can enter a command and you can see the result, but then the code is gone. As you begin writing longer chunks of code and wishing to modify your programs, it's helpful to have a place where you can save and edit your code. That's what the editor area is for. This is essentially a text document where you can write your code, save it, and recall it at a later time. This is where you'll be doing most of your programming when using MATLAB. The workspace is where all of your variables are stored. MATLAB has no idea what your variable definitions are until you define them. In other words, if you want to assign the variable a to the value of 10, you must tell it to do so. Notice that you can define variables from the command window or the editor. Finally, once you begin developing some code, you'll want to save it so you can return to it at a later time. When you save the contents of the editor, you're saving something called an M file. The .m file type is specific to MATLAB and it's the primary file type for storing your code. Notice that when you save an M file, or script, the name of the file appears in the current folder window. The current folder window displays all of the M files currently visible to MATLAB. MATLAB can only work out of one folder at a time, so it's necessary to navigate to the correct path when you open MATLAB. The easiest way to set the proper path is to click the Browse for Folder icon and navigate to the correct folder. This is a useful way to keep your MATLAB code organized by class or by project. Now that we've gone over the basic anatomy of the MATLAB environment, we can start learning some basic operations and functions. The very first thing we can do is to treat MATLAB as a calculator. You can perform basic arithmetic operations as you would on any calculator. For example, in the command window, you can type 1 plus 3 to see that the answer is 4. MATLAB takes into account order of operations, so using parentheses is necessary to separate isolated computations. Notice that 5 times 2 plus 2 is 12, whereas 5 times quantity 2 plus 2 is 20. One of the things that makes MATLAB so powerful is its ease of defining variables. Whereas most programming languages require you to pre-allocate a variable name and data type, MATLAB allows you to define variables in a single line of code. In MATLAB, the equal sign is used to denote variable definitions. In other words, typing a variable name, then equal sign, says assign the variable a to whatever comes after the equal sign. In this case, let's just make it equal to 5. Notice once you execute this code, the variable a appears in the workspace as you defined it. It's important to remember that MATLAB only understands the variables that you define. If you define another variable, b, equal to 6, then I can ask MATLAB, what's the sum of a and b? However, if I ask MATLAB to give me the sum of a, b, and c, I'll get an error because the variable c isn't defined. 
Here's a fun fact. MATLAB is a combination of the words matrix, laboratory. I mention this because nearly everything in MATLAB is considered to be a matrix. Notice the symbols for the variables A and B in the workspace. It looks like a window, but it's actually the symbol for a 2x2 two two matrix. MATLAB leverages the power of matrix manipulations to perform efficient computations. Defining arrays and matrices in MATLAB is easy. I can define a 1 by n array or vector using the same equal sign notation that I use for the definitions of A and B, only for an array or a matrix you simply have to use square brackets. Let's define a 1 by 5 vector called V by typing V equals square bracket 1 space 2 space 3 space 4 space 5 close square bracket. Now in the workspace, the vector v appears with the same symbol as the scalar values a and b, but with different dimensions. Notice if we define a much longer vector y, the actual value of the variable is no longer shown in the workspace because there's not enough space to display the whole thing. Instead, it shows as a 1 by 12 double, where double just refers to the default data type, which is double precision floating point. Again, a lot of this underlying information is masked by MATLAB in order to make the language more user-friendly. MATLAB also contains many hundreds of built-in functions and variables. In other words, the variables for pi and the imaginary number, for example, are already built into MATLAB. Basic functions are already programmed and ready for use as well. Taking the square root of a value or computing the sine of an angle is straightforward. Time functions are easily defined in MATLAB as well. The colon operator serves a few purposes in MATLAB and is very useful when defining long functions. The colon operator is useful here as it allows you to define an increment or spacing of a vector. We can define a time vector t from 0 to 10 seconds in increments of every tenth of a second. In other words, it's a vector ranging from this value to this value in increments of the middle value. With the time vector defined, we can now define a function of that time vector. For example, x equals sine of t will return a vector of the same dimensions as t and representing the sine of the input argument. If you have two vectors of the same length, you can easily plot them against one another to see the result. The function we're using here is a plot function which requires two arguments the independent argument first, which is time, then the dependent argument second, which is the sine function. Unlike many other software programs, the help function in MATLAB is extremely useful. If you're curious about how to use a particular function, you can type help and then the name of the function in the command window. You'll see a very detailed document of what the function is for and how to use it. Many functions in MATLAB can be used in different ways, so the help menu is extremely valuable when figuring out the particular syntax. Syntax, by the way, is simply the specific way to type out the code so that the program can recognize it. For example, if we look at the help menu for the plot function, we can see the many different options available to us for visualizing our data. According to this help menu, there's an option called a string specifier, which allows us to change the line color and line type of our data by using a third argument in the function. An argument is simply the input to a particular built-in function. In this instance, we use three arguments for the plot function, the time vector, the sine function, and now the third argument, which is a string specifier to change the appearance of the plot. We'll cover plotting in much greater detail at a later time. For now, I want to give you a few more basic operations you can do in MATLAB to get started. Defining a matrix is a skill required to be proficient in MATLAB. Fortunately, defining matrices is nearly as simple as defining a constant or a vector. You'll again use the equal sign and square brackets, with the only difference being that the rows of a matrix are defined by the semicolon operator. Once we define a matrix, we can begin to learn how to manipulate it. Notice that when I type A of 3, 4, I get the 3, 4 element of the matrix A. In other words, the third row, fourth column. 
Now if I use what I know about the equal sign, I can redefine the 3, 4 element of the matrix A to be a different value. Notice the syntax. A parentheses 3 comma 4 really means that the first argument represents the rows and the second argument represents the columns. Thus, I can change the third row and fifth column to a different value by using the same syntax. A neat way to do the same thing here is to use the end function. End in MATLAB refers to the last element. If I use end in the rows argument, it refers to a value of 3 because there's 3 rows. But if I use the end function in the columns argument, it refers to a value of 5 because there are 5 columns in the matrix A. This is useful when the matrix size is either very large or of unknown size. The colon operator and the vector notation also works within the matrix arguments. For example, if I want to change the first and third rows all to a value of 0, I can use the following syntax. In this piece of code, the first argument is now a vector containing values 1 and 3. The second argument, again referring to the columns, is the colon operator, which just means all or every. By executing this code, you can see that the first and third rows and all columns have been changed to a value of 0. The last couple of things I want to cover in this video refer to general practices when writing scripts or M files. When you run a script by pressing the play button, MATLAB executes each line of code sequentially as it goes down the M file. In other words, line 1 is completely executed before line 2, and so on. Writing our code with this in mind, we can begin to construct more complex programs that do several tasks very quickly. For example, we can create a plot of cosine of t and execute all of the required lines of code by simply running the script. First, we'll define the time vector as we've already done. And before we complete this very simple script, I want to introduce the idea of commenting. Commenting in MATLAB, or any language for that matter, is a highly recommended practice because it provides additional information about what the code is doing. This is especially helpful if you are collaborating with colleagues on a common piece of code, or if you want to remember what you are doing if you revisit this code in the future. To comment in MATLAB, use a percent symbol and then begin typing. The code should turn green, which is an indication that it's a comment. MATLAB ignores comments and does not treat them as code. Continuing with this example, we can define the cosine function and create a plot of a specific line type and provide a title and a legend. If at any point there's an error in the code, MATLAB is pretty good about letting you know where the error was. In this case, the argument for the legend is supposed to be a string, meaning a text value surrounded by single quotes. Running the script now, we can see the resulting cosine plot. In many cases, your code may start to get fairly long, and it may serve different purposes as well. In this case, it's often useful to break up your script into smaller, more manageable chunks by using code cells. To define a code cell, you can type a double percent sign, a space, then a description of what's in that cell. In this cell, I'll add some code to produce a different plot. The nice thing about code cells is that each cell can be run independently by right-clicking and selecting Run Current Section. This is very useful when debugging long bits of code or writing a single M file with many different components. At this point, I'm going to end this introductory video to give you a chance to apply some of these basic concepts. In the next video, we'll pick up with iteration and logical procedures like for loops, while loops, and if statements.